to talk to everybody about today is advanced theme performance techniques. And uh, just to kick it off with a few questions for my part. Um, I'm assuming that you know the majority of you have developed, obviously, your own themes, show hands, plugins. You've um, no doubt tried to use just about everything that you can find in the codex. Is that right? Everyone loves the codex? <laughs> Raise your hand if you don't love the codex. You admit it. Wow. Okay. Um, I have some people who want to talk to you. Um, no, seriously, like, uh, let's work together to uh, improve that, right? It's a wiki after all. Um, but uh, definitely need to fall in love with the codex. So, a little about me, if I can get the same page. So I'm a busy guy. Um, I'm a husband of approximately six years, and uh, the joke that I like to give is that uh, no kids yet. Um, first step would be a dog, and if that goes well, we'll take it from there. Um, founder of W3Edge, which is an agency that's pivoted or evolved over the years from doing just basic hosting to uh, building websites on lots of different technologies, mostly WordPress now, to uh, building software. Who here uses W3 Total Cache? Almost 50, 60 percent. Um, and we have some more products coming out end of this year, early next year. Uh, what we do, we work with like Yoast Devok, we do search engine optimization, social media optimization, and marketing, all those types of things. Uh, W3 Markup is a code production service I founded in 2007 and sold in 2008. Who's ever used that service by any chance? A few people. Okay. Um, who reads Mashable? Good. So you've seen my work there, hopefully daily. Um, and Playster.com is a new project that I've been working on um, for the real estate industry. It's, it's an advertising network. Um, and actually it makes, us, makes a lot of use of multi-site, which I think is pretty cool. So, some assumptions. I'd like to just get some things out of the way, and obviously the questions that I asked kind of already dealt with that, but I insist that you love the codex if, if you don't love it. And um, if you don't love it, then uh, I encourage you to find the time to contribute to it. I can't say that I've done as much as I'd like, uh, but I have, I don't know, 10 pages in my watch list, so try to beat that. Um, the loop is something, obviously, all of us have to understand intimately. This is just a, a trivially, trivial example out of, the, out of the codex, of course. But um, it really was uh, 2010 that I think really opened the doors and opened my mind in terms of how to actually return a page, right? How to properly do that. So we look at Mashable and you look at the channels and the way that that works with flushing the rewrites and just trying to take total control and reduce the number of queries that we're making in order to return those, those I call them roll pages. Um, 2010, 2011, great resources for those of you who are not like, fully leveraging the loop, so deep dive into those if you can. Um, another one, hooks, tags, and conditionals. Um, I was just talking to Nathan about this earlier. If you haven't explored as deeply as, uh, deeply enough to have a conversation with Nathan where he doesn't, you know, drop some knowledge on you, I invite you to, uh, uh, to spend some more time in there. Um, obviously, custom taxonomies, post types. I think I have an example here in, um, on another slide of uh, custom, uh, custom format that I've done. Um, take advantage of these things. Explore them if you have them. Right? So just quickly racing through these. And then custom menus. You know, Obviously, the Blue Themes guys are phenomenal. Take advantage of those things. How many of you are like building things for yourselves, your organization, or you build things that you release? Just curious. So releasing things, that's the show of hands there? OK. Cool. Um, widgets. Everybody knows about widgets. If you're not using them properly, make sure that you do. One of the things that I'll be doing related to performance later, um, and I don't have code that I can share because I didn't have time to anonymize it enough to be able to share it, is um, being able to take the output of a widget, and there's some plugins that do this as well, I think widget cache obviously comes to mind, but take the output of a widget and be able to cache that so that, you know, similar to memoization and other types of optimization, 
you don't have to go and make whatever database calls or, or third party calls to return those types of things. But anyway, uh, just obviously assuming that you know some of these things. So in terms of fundamentals, one of the things that has always bothered me and one of the things that, uh, especially at Mashable, I've been working on um, for version 6 of the site, which was about a year and a half ago to version 7, which is the one that we're iterating on now, is really getting the structure right and taking advantage of you know, the naming and file conventions that exist in the hierarchy. So if you've used the codex at all or if you haven't, go check it out. Make sure you understand this intimately, especially if you work with custom taxonomies. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. It's kind of a recurring theme in this talk. Uh, take advantage of this and, uh, and make it work for you. Um, one thing that I don't know if uh, is commonly understood, and um, I would imagine that it isn't based on lots of the code that I've seen in plugins today, but the larger the heap, um, the greater the execution time. And so basically what that means is, I think, um, I think it's a 2010 theme. Uh, if you grab the functions.php file out of there and then you actually load it up and check that with like xdebug, uh, for example, or, or apc or something like that, you'll see that it multiplies to be like, you know, that 20, 30k file ends up being about a megabyte in heap in memory. And so the thing to consider, and those of you who are using W3 Total Cache will appreciate this, um, the team that I've been fortunate enough to build to, to start to help me with that project has actually been working this past uh, couple weeks or so on reducing the, the memory utilization there. So the reason why that's significant is because if you've ever seen anyone complain that W3 Total Cache is a memory hog, or if you've ever deployed a plugin or written some code where you know you hit the memory limit for PHP or something like that, it's likely, um, amongst other things, this is the net effect that caused that problem, right? So it doesn't matter how small the file is, um, in general, when it's, once it gets into memory, it's going to be larger, it's going to have an impact on the performance because the way PHP, PHP works, the more stuff you have in memory, the slower it's going to go. It's a really old technology, relatively speaking, and that's just the nature of the beast. Um, so one of the things that I have here on the slide is, is something that I do at Mashable, uh, which is I try to break out files as much as I can. So functions.php basically you know, jumps into a directory and loads a number of we can call them partials, but basically uh, different individual files that contain functionality. Not like a plugin per se, but just breaking out those files so that I don't just have this huge file in memory for, you know, just for no reason. I'm able to have a little bit more control and I'm able to, to, uh, to focus uh, my code a little bit more concisely. Um, one of the things that's uh, completely ridiculous that uh, really, really bothers me when I think about like where like you know w3edge.com used to be years ago and where Mashable used to be years ago when I first met Pete with you know 20 some odd plugins or something like that running is that all these plugins aren't necessary you know it's really my philosophy that ultimately unless you really need a UI and a UI that's not extending you know the WordPress default uh, administrative UI panels there's really no reason to have plugins because for me for my part I'm just not interested in in adding things that, that, that you know, I'm not going to deactivate or activate or update frequently. If I'm going to update something in my theme, I'd rather have the functionality, uh, excuse me, in my site, I'd rather have the functionality right in my theme and have control of it. I'd rather be able to, um, to just rip out the bits I need, especially when you think about that heat thing that I explained earlier with memory usage. So in general, a good, a good philosophy, or at least the philosophy that we've had at Mashable for years is we've gone down to just a handful of plugins um, from dozens is really just to graduate, uh, just take the reverse view, graduate the functionality that you've been adding to your theme to a plugin as you feel the need to have some kind of UI for it. And I know you can do that in your theme, but just have that separation. Um, I think just conceptually for me, it's just worked a heck of a lot better. I know that you can go either direction, but that's my preference. I recommend it. Um, the fewer files, the better. Um, when you think about child themes, when you think about the usage of, well, I don't know say it that way. When you think about how many things you have to load into memory, how those files behave, um, unless you're really like just an absolute server guru and you know exactly how often your scripts are getting called and how much memory they're using and, and what your targets are and you're thinking about things in that way, keep things simple, you know, 
develop a child theme, eliminate some unnecessary plugins, you know, God forbid you take a few functions out of there and just drop them in your theme to do whatever it is you need to do. Just keep it simple and your site will perform better even if you don't use any caching. Cleaning up the head is something that I just have to mention. This is not a great example. I, you know, I'll, I'll drop a better example in there before I put it on the slideshow for you. But um, using blog info, for example, is going to create some additional queries that you don't need to fire. So just do some hard coding. I mean, it's, it's basic, uh, you know, performance 101. A lot of the things like, you know, and obviously this presumes that you know exactly, you know, who your readers are, where they're coming from, and you don't need to generate anything on the fly. You know, with that caveat. Blog info, for example, is just a completely unnecessary call to make in many, many cases. So keep that simple. You know, hard coding isn't necessarily a bad thing. And uh, you know, with like uh, uh, W2 Total Cache, for example, you can actually grab anything out of the head, for example, in terms of CSS or JS, and like put it wherever you want. So hard coding, you know, your uh, your CSS and JS isn't going to be the end of the world. Microformats. I have to throw this in here as well because you guys could be happy that I did. I'd encourage you guys to explore some of the rich snippets um, that, are, that Google's been kind of evangelizing uh, lately. Uh, there's actually a post on Yoast's site about that uh, by me. It actually will help your search engine ranking, so I'm just going to toss that in as kind of a, a freebie. I recommend that in your theming. There's a lot you can get into besides these bullets um, for micro formats, but it's something that I, I just recommend. I love markup, so explore that. So it's rich snippets. You can check it out on Google. You can Google it on, uh, on Yoast's site as well. Very helpful. Um, I think Nason would like this as well. One of the most uh, just superlative things about where WordPress is going is these themes that come out every year. So again, as I said earlier, explore them deeply. Develop your child themes off them if you haven't already. Um, Hopefully, WordPress.org will also support uh, child themes in their theme repository soon enough. And uh, I think that will, well, hopefully that will kind of change the landscape a little bit because these are great tools. So if you haven't explored them, explore them, tighten up your code. Uh, there's really some solid examples in there, especially the 2011 and new header stuff as well. So. This is just a really important example for me. Um, the object cache in WordPress, in my experience, is a bit hairy at times. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, that you know, you add a define to your wp-config file, which says, you know, uh, uh, you know, diff oh, shoot, I'm spacing on the directive. I'm sure you all know it. WP total cache will make sure you do if you don't. Um, but in any event, using the object cache is just it's absolutely vital. So. When you look at a site like Mashable or, or Smashing Magazine or any of the ones that are running W3 Total Cache, for example, one of the things that happens is uh, when you actually fire up the cache and you cache to some backend like uh, an opco cache or memcache or something like that, you're ultimately reducing the number of queries that you're making. And so why this matters in your theme is ultimately just like it would matter for a plugin or what have you, uh, like blog info, for example, or for transients and things like that. Being able to use the object cache basically means that if you're using a memory-based uh, backend, you're able to keep all that data in memory, which means that when a call comes in, like if you have a BuddyPress site, which is highly dynamic, it's really difficult to cache your pages, you'll get much better uh, response time to your users to be able to drive more engagement and keep them captivated, if you will, because they're not waiting on pages to come back. Maybe they're waiting on Google or Facebook plugins to load or something like that, but that's not really something that you can control. So with the object cache, in this particular example, this is a bad example where I'm actually making a custom post template. Um, the reason why this is bad is because this actually generates a query. Um, and this other example, same idea, a little bit more code, but it actually uses the object cache. And it performs quite a bit better. Right? So if you're actually caching um, you know, your object cache to a memory-based backend, you're even better off. Um, so even when you enable WP, cache, WP underscore cache um, you know, in your WP cache config file, um, you know, and you're caching to disk using a plugin or something like that, you're still a little bit better off as long as you don't have shared hosting. So this is an important kind of thing to remember. I mean, this directly relates to your themes. And if you're using custom taxonomies, post types, playing with for, uh, post formats, or you have a situation like Mashable does, like on the infographics page, for example, where, you know, there's a normal page, uh, post page, it's like single.php, but, you know, you want to change the layout um, without doing too much heavy lifting, Something like this gives you exactly the control you need without a huge performance penalty. 
Caching fragments or partials is a really big deal. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, I don't have an example for you. I'll try to add one before I put these slides online, so if you check for it later, I'll have one for you. But the idea is pretty simple. I mean, the theory is very straightforward. So let's say, for example, and this is actually a very big deal, lots of you guys have, like, I should say you guys, lots of people have plugins that, like, track page views, so they have a page view count, or they, they have some kind of plugin that's trying to track, you know, popular posts and things of that nature. And one of the mistakes that often occurs is they're just hitting the database just religiously and relentlessly, and they kill their site. So if you get any kind of uh, significant traffic, or if you actually care about user experience, the, the actual... Uh, time to first bite, the time it takes for the server to respond to that page is horrific because, you know, Apache or Nginx's response to request is going to be like an order of magnitude faster than the response from PHP itself. Um, so caching fragments means, for example, that widget or that sidebar component that you have for, um, uh, for your popular post or for your page view count or whatever it is, if you just... Uh, simply just take the output that that, phone, that, that, that code is uh, spitting out and put it in a file or put it in a memory-based backend and then request it from the, from the cache as opposed to making the call to the database or like we did on Mashable, making a call to like the Google Analytics API, which I actually recommend as opposed to using your own backend. Then what happens is, obviously you can return that page, you can build and, and return that page back so your execution time is lower. And then more importantly, if um, if you actually need to do something like popular posts and you're calling an API, like maybe it's based on Twitter, maybe it's based on Google Analytics stats, whatever it is, you're able to go ahead and pull that data out, keep it cached, and then, more importantly, if you actually have to make another call to see if it's updated, because you want to update your page, you want to have the latest stats, you want to make sure that your list of popular posts is up to date, all you really have to do is just, if something goes wrong, is just return the dirty cache, and then you don't have this, uh, you know, this 30 second response time before you can spit out a page because your fragments and your partials are working for you. Now, the difference between a, a fragment and a partial is usually when you're using like Git post template or something like that, that's kind of what I think of as a partial. Um, the only difference between, um, the reason why I'm coupling these and, and making a distinction between Git post template and fragments and, and partials is because partials is more like what I was talking about when I showed you on an earlier slide where I have functions.php calling, uh, not calling, but loading up essentially functions directory full of files. So, so to a certain extent, they're not necessarily like uh, like static parts of a template. They're not, they're not like HTML snippets or something like that, but I would call them partials, and that's actually what I do, where I literally have a series of files, and they have just the functionality that I need, and I can just keep everything self-contained. So your fragments, obviously, are going to consist of, you know, your spit, what's ever in your widgets, and partials, I think, of something like components that actually are constituent parts of returning a page um, that are less static, usually. External services, that's uh, what I was talking about a moment ago. I mean, a typical example is exactly what I said. You know, don't use your database to generate anything if you can. If you use external services, which I recommend, it give you a much more engaging site, much more rich feeling site when you're able to use APIs to, to build really engaging user experiences around things like uh, trending topics and things like that, stuff that Mashable does. Like I said, we use the Google Analytics uh, API, and the only way to make that work, I don't know if any of you play with it, yes, you can use like the batch API to make sure you get more data back in a single call, but it's horrifically slow, and um, you know, Twitter goes down, and Facebook has anomalies, even with their, their OAuth and all kinds of things that they have over there, even though they've got plenty of money to get it right, things go wrong. Um, so like I said, when you make those calls and you generate that cache, if you're putting it in the object cache, you're using a transient cache, which is probably more probable, which is more likely, then um, make sure that you, know, you write your code in such a way that if you're not able to make that call or the next time like you've used WPCron to go out and make that call to generate that cache file, if it, if it fails, make sure you just return a dirty cache just for that one visitor and just queue up another one in WPCron, another call to, to go get that data for you. Um, is that helpful to people? I don't know if people are thinking about using caching in that way or if you guys do. So if you do, let me know. Because, okay. Um, so using W3 Total Cache. You all use it. I was going to kind of race through some of the, the updates that are available in the de development version. Uh, the memory usage is, you're going to see is, uh, the memory utilization optimization you're going to see is going to speed up your site uh, for lots of um, common configurations for like shared hosting, things like that. What you're actually going to see is 
Typically, disk enhance, which means you're using um, Apache to return the file, so you have a really great response time. Um, browser caching, which is going to give you compression. It's going to give you header. Um, it's going to set your headers in terms of um, expires. I don't recommend using e-tags, but it's going to also do your um, your cache control and so on. Um, take advantage of those things. The memory usage for using that is way down. So if you guys are building sites for your clients and you're deploying sites and uh, you want to give them a great experience, it's a lot easier than it was before to get that installed, like far fewer activation errors, things like that. Um, even more importantly, uh, one of the keys, key reasons to use W3 Total Cache, and I'll show you guys in a little bit, is in the debug mode, you're able to actually see, uh, in, if you view the source, there's going to be an HTML comment that shows you what's being loaded, what's being cached. So as you do your development, as you're maybe trying to reduce your plugin count, and you're plucking some code out of there and maybe make some database calls, you're trying to use the, the object cache, things like that, you can use debug mode to go in there and see if you're actually successfully caching those objects. There's a lot of other tools even built directly into WordPress to do that, but if you just get used to using uh, the tool in that way, I find it to be pretty productive. Um, it's very, very productive to use it as well to, you know, to just keep an eye on uh, not only which database queries are cached, but if you're actually successfully eliminating that or if you're writing them in a way that can, can be cached. I was also talking to Nathan about this earlier, which was a great reminder. Um, really don't, I mean, it's just, you know, it's almost blasphemy in my mind. Avoid making direct calls to the database. Um, I don't expect anyone to admit if they've done that, but uh, don't do that. Uh, because if you don't, I mean, one of the benefits is obviously W3 Total Cash is going to come to the rescue. Um, <coughs> hopefully. So, bulletproofing. Uh, these are things that most of you guys know already. If you don't, um, hopefully this is extremely helpful. I, this is what I do actually in production at times. I, th I find it really, really helpful. So you fire up WP Debug, which is going to usually spit out some output output um, directly into the site. All right? So if you're, you've got a production site that's getting some traffic or you don't want your client like having a look and being like, hey, my site says all this stuff, like I hate you now, etc., <laughs> you can um, just turn on the log. And uh, what it's going to do is it's going to write it out to wp content forward slash excuse me debug log, mm -hmm. and then for a limited time or you know depending on the, the travel level of the site, you can run it as long as you want. But you'll get all that data you want without displaying it, which I find to be absolutely amazing. The reason why it's so significant is because obviously when you're testing, I mean you all know this already. When you're testing on your own machine, you're testing cases that you can imagine, you can fathom. But out in the wild, things differ, right? So I think this is a great tip. Um, Xdebug is a phenomenal tool. Um, I don't know how many of you use it, but it's a, it's a PHP module. Um, actually, it's available for lots of different languages. And there's a number of profiler tools out there, like Wincache, things like that. I think one of the later releases comes with a web-based tool as well. Actually, let me see if I can uh, fire that up. The reason why this tool is so helpful is it's part of how you know I came to realize um, what I explained about heaps. Um, so WebGrind is a tool that that uh, is actually spit out um, with the build of of Xdebug, and what it's indicating here, for example, is that there's some uh, some curl calls that are particularly expensive, and uh, I can actually see this on my screen. But well, that's the idea. It helps you visualize what's going on. How many calls are made? Which ones are the most expensive? And it gives you some idea of what you need to go in and remedy. Because like I said, out in the wild, things obviously behave differently. So it's a great tool. Um, one of the other things that was particularly useful in, uh, in debugging and understanding heap and, and memory usage and execution time and, and making things crisp and performant is obviously APC. So I recommend that over every other object cache, uh, aqua cache, excuse me, um, if for no other reason then it's going to end up being um, it's no doubt going to end up being part of uh, I believe PHP 6 that's right really wait, right do you remember that one who knows that what are you asking isn't uh, APC going to be the next release of uh, the next major release of PHP it's not in PHP 5.4 until it's going to come out yet so the, the okay. goal is yes so hopefully that's coming sooner than later. It's, it's long overdue because PHP is extremely slow, especially compared to something like Ruby, which you just compile it and runs in memory, you know, as many of you know. 
Um, but anyway, this is just a perfect example. Like, so I talked earlier about the functions.php file that on the disk was 20k, but then ultimately when you when you do the math on it, you know, it ends up being you know the better half of a megabyte. And when you compare that, you know, to what it is on the disk, I mean, it just it's a it's a significant difference, right? So that's just the math for those of you that you know are visual. But um, in any event, uh, Xdebug is phenomenal. Take advantage of it if you're a hardcore developer. If you're not, um, kind of play with it. It's going to be worth it for you. Um, so I just talked about debug modes. Here's a quick uh, slide just showing a couple of the ones that I, you know, that I usually tick off when I'm uh, getting down to business. Um, again, this goes back to Nason, who, you know, who set me straight on, on a number of things that I was doing. I even switched to some of the WordPress APIs, even though uh, I found them to be a bit slower than things that I was doing, particularly for HTTP calls. Uh, but some of the reasons why you weren't going to want to use these things, even though you know when you think about performance, some of them may not be as fast as you know, your down and dirty implementation, is really just going to be because they're going to be bulletproof for you, right? You're, you're thinking about how many years has WordPress been in play, how many installations, how many deployments across different servers and environments and all these various use cases. It works, right? So use it, that's why. Um, and then what I'd recommend is that, you know, at the end of the day, you just, if you find something that's not performant, something that's not working the way that you'd like, or you think you have a, a, something to offer that can make it perform better, just, you know, uh, share a patch with the team and hopefully that gets into play and then everyone benefits. Right, so that's you know I think that's open source at its finest right there. Um, so the codex has just like you know a pretty good amount of, of uh, resources for you. I think you find a lot more if you Google. So again, for those of you who don't love the codex, it's a good opportunity for you to get out there and actually make it lovable by contributing some of that stuff that you, either you've learned or you've discovered in your travels. Uh, because the codex has you know absolutely no problem linking out to other sites as well, which is not bad for use for those of you care about that. Um, some rec recommendations and tips beyond some of the formalities and, uh, and details and kind of intimate insight into how I think about some of these things. Um, WordPress SEO by Yoast. I saw some tweets saying that all-in-one SEO is great. Lots of the um, lots of the plugins out there are pretty solid. Lots of theme frameworks have some pretty good like fundamentals going for them. This particular plugin, um, honestly, simply because it works and I've, I've worked with Yoast on it, uh, it, it has just a completely different viewpoint of how to do your SEO. So I invite you to kind of explore in that. You can also migrate in or out or of whatever it is that you're using and get into it. Um, it's also had some performance issues that have long since been resolved, so it's a great tool. It's right there in the, it's right in there with your, your post editing, just giving you an idea of the best practices, guidelines, how many characters for this, that, or the other thing. So I think it's a really solid tool. Obviously we talked about W3 Total Cache. I don't need to beat that horse any further. And Vault Press um, is a phenomenal tool. So who's used it by the way? Okay, everyone should be using it. It's amazing. Thank you. One of the key reasons why it's amazing is it, it like keeps an eye on the integrity of your files. So above and beyond just the whole backup process and just literally having a peace of mind of knowing that you just have all these versions of your site basically that you can restore to and all this other type of stuff, it actually keeps track of the integrity. So when, you know, if, if your host does a bad job and you get some kind of injection or something like that, VaultPress is going to be instrumental in you recording that, right? So if you have a consultancy and you know, you want to take really good care of your customers, this tool will make your job easier. It's not free, but it's worth it. Another thing that's really helpful is a, a post I put together in February. Um, I was actually just talking to Steve Savers last night, and uh, he gave me his blessing on it, so I recommend it. I need to update it for, for the plus one button. But if you check out that link, um, just about everything that I've, uh, almost everything that I've optimized for Mashable in terms of widgets and plugins, so we're talking about you know the tweet me button, which is now obviously the Twitter button, and uh, you know all the Facebook plugins, uh, ad nauseum, you know add this, share this, all that type of thing. Tips on how to just do the fundamental optimizations for performance for the end user perspective, right? So thus far I've been talking about how to just construct your themes and think about you know some of the pitfalls and avoid them in terms of you know putting together in a way that performs well out of the box without caching, and then how caching extends that. 
this is what, what I'm talking about here is actually what's delivered to the end user when they load up that page and how to position like uh, descriptive eddings and things like that or how to actually do the implementation so that it performs better when someone loads that page. Like Facebook, for example, is really, really challenging. So um, if you use like the, um, uh, the fan box or the comments plugin or any of those things from Facebook, definitely check out this post. It's going to actually help you know, increase your comment counts, keep people on your site, things like that. So, cheers. Uh, I'd like to take some questions. Um, hopefully someone has some zingers for me, so I look at Anybody? Fire away. Um, so, so, what's the difference between uh, W3 cache and WP super cache? I asked that same question on Twitter, because I was confused. Someone said W3 super cache. I'm like, what's that? Um, it's kind of like... I don't want to be derogatory, but it's like WC, WP Super Cache. I'll just tell you a story. How about that? Three years ago, yeah, three years ago, when I was trying to like address some performance issues from Ashville, I went to Donic and I was like, "Hey, I like to contribute because you know this doesn't work on network-based storage. Like it just you know shits the bed, pardon the French." And um, that's not his fault or anything. That's you know that was how network storage worked back then. And so, you know, things didn't go that well in terms of like figuring out how to work together. So I ended up starting, you know, W3 Total Cache as a project. And where that began was really just addressing the issue of where do I store stuff when I can't rely on my network storage system because I don't have 50 Gs to go get a SAN, right? Um, and so, sort of using memcache, exploring the opcode cache, getting into the object cache in WordPress, and, and fighting with some of the anomalies in there. Used a lot of a lot of things that are still available today and they didn't really work. And so what ended up happening is W3 Total Cache went from, okay, let me cache the pages, let me cache the database queries, oh, I have to cache the object cache so I can reach my database queries, oh, I need to do minify because my payloads are terrible and there's too many objects to download, and oh, I need to do, I need to set my headers properly so I'm using the browser cache properly so people stop requesting so many things from me, oh, I should add CloudFront because that's got more security for people who are getting you know, uh, denial of service attacks or get, getting unnecessary injections. Oh, I've got to do you know, 300 other things. So W3 Total Cache, like if you study performance and you go to like read Steve Souder's blog and things like that, or you like use Google PageSpeed, which is now integrated into the dashboard of W3 Total Cache, it does everything that you need to do at a high level, because there's always more to do, that helps you optimize your site. So if you just set it up, plug it in, chip away, trying to figure out which settings are appropriate for your site. Because you can use your site in lots of different ways, right? It can be a flat new site. If you can actually build apps on WordPress, which I love to see. You can have a BuddyPress site, which is highly dynamic. You can obviously have blogs. You can go all in any direction you want, right? You can do it all on your theme, or you can have 300 plugins if uh, I didn't convince you not to do that. Um, so WP SuperCache originally set out as a fork of WP Cache, and its goal was just to cache pages. but in practice, like you know, scaling WordPress just requires more than that. And so, you know, Donica has done a good job of like you know making sure that the users that update get more information about how to take it to the next level. But W3 Total Cache, you know, in my in my estimation, is the only performance framework that's that's going to do the heavy lifting that makes a difference. To answer your question. Yeah. Cool. You. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to put that in there earlier, but he asked like examples of when to use a transient cache. So for example, in that Google Analytics, uh, using Google Analytics API to determine your popular posts in a sidebar widget or something like that, it's a perfect example, right? So you say, you make the, you use like, I'll just tell you what I did. Like you use uh, WordPress cron uh, to make, you know, to make the call to go get the data, and then you just store it using, um, you know, set transients, basically, right? For however, like, I just do it for a day, right? And then you know you just check for it if it's there. You just keep returning it, right? And then when it expires, you know if you haven't used disk space, I mean you, you're in trouble, right? Because you got to make a call again, and you're blocking when you make that call. That's why I recommend you know using a file-based cache. But anyway, that's how I would use it. It's very straightforward. So it's um, you know transients. I think came in. When did that come in, Nathan? Was that three? Or two nine? Two eight. Two eight. I was wrong. So phenomenal. That's how I use it. So the idea is just you know. Make your calls, set the time, you know, the time that you want to use it, off you go, let it expire. No garbage collection. 
Can you talk a little bit more about how can you talk a little bit more about how you break out functions into the policy and the loop? How you break out what? We were talking about uh, breaking out policy and what we need to kind of talk a little bit more about that. I still can't hear what you said in the end. I'm sorry. Uh, you were talking about keeping down your heap uh, and breaking out functions the only little bit you need. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What in particular are you interested in? Like, yeah, um, I'm just curious how you handle the specifics of it. You know, how do you are you like at the top of every template, for example, requiring a couple file functions files or? Um, I think. The easiest way to kind of get your head around it is like there's no escape, right? And it's you know I didn't find an easy way to like pluck things out of memory to like keep PHP lean so the execution time would be better. Like the only way to really optimize PHP in my experience is not code cache. But the the issue with heap in particular, like so I'll tell you what I did. So like W3 to cache is like just monstrous, just tons of stuff in there from years ago and and everything else. And so. When I was putting it together, you know, it's it's my only like WordPress publicly released plugin. So when I was putting it together, I had like all my WP admin stuff right in there in one of my core files. So when you load it up, like there's HTML in there, and that still counts against your heap. It's stupid. It was it was dumb, you know. But I didn't really think too much about it at that time because I was solving a problem where that didn't matter, right? Which is where these problems come from, right? Um, so the issue there was literally just. Um, Separating, you know, my UI from one of my core files reduced the heat because I told you like a 20k file ended up being like the better part of a megabyte, you know, in the heat. Um, so separating that stuff out and then literally uh, just thinking conscientiously about, you know, switches and everything else to, you know, determine when to include various files require once and so on and so forth allowed me to just separate more and more files out. And you know, using memoization and things like that, other performance techniques, so you don't make unnecessary calls. And you end up with um, kind of a, a distributed memory usage, which gives you a net lower execution time. Cool. Your example made it seem like you were including all of the files anyway. But it seems like the performance gain comes from not including certain bits of PHP. All right, I'm sorry, I was unclear. So the idea is not like, I'm not, I wasn't concatenating all those files and throwing it into the into memory. I was loading like all these individual files that's just automatically more performant than like a 300k functions.php. Does that make sense? And that seems like a bug in PHP if it's true. Well, we can talk about that like all night, actually. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, so. So are you saying that you you have like uh, for example files in your you have functions loaded in your for example you have files in there that you're loading only for example when you're doing a post as opposed to page or vice versa or are you loading all of that code all the time because you're just breaking out the separate files? All right, I see where you guys are what you're after. Yeah, I'm loading all those files, but I have like a lib directory that has files that I'll load conditionally. Right, so those functions rely on like my ink directory, which has a number of files in it, my lib directory, which has like you know third-party things like JSON.php that I generate, right? Like third-party things. So I'm when I'm when I'm calling my functions, it's literally just my like my API files for that theme, and those functions and methods like will load up whatever they need conditionally. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah. It didn't, it didn't give that impression, especially when it was on the slides. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's not the easiest way to put it forward, sorry. Um, do you use a lot of child The question was, do I use a lot of child themes? Um, in practice, no. Um, because I'm stubborn and I just like like break things and I think I can do it better than other people. But like... <laughs> Is there a performance difference between creating a child theme and just copying like 2011 and then making your own thing? The reason why I was encouraging you guys to use uh, 2011 and use child themes, and the reason why it's a good practice and it was really intelligent of WordPress, uh, WordPress core team uh, to, to put that together, is because if you put your own theme together, like yeah, you can make certain optimizations and things like that. But the key thing that that really kind of really tickles me, for lack of a better expression, is 
you know, in the next release, you get those updates and improvements to the functionality, and you don't have to deal with that. And then when you're putting together your child theme, it's still consistent with the other principle that I recommended, which is having fewer files, because you're only going to have template files, et cetera, for the things that you want to change. Right? So it's still a net win, like, in practice. This is kind of an advocacy piece, but even if you have like the best backend caching on your uh, WordPress Apache, there's still a huge value to just having a front-end proxy in place that handles all the communication to the clients. Because what that allows you to do is, say you have a really slow mobile client, it's going to eat one of your very heavy Apache servers, the whole transaction. Whereas if you have a front-end proxy, something very lightweight like Nginx, that will handle all of that transfer to the client and free up that heavyweight Apache much quicker. So it allows you to have um, much better memory usage over time, even if your front end proxy isn't doing any caching or anything else for you. So I just wanted to put that forward. It's a huge benefit. I don't know. I haven't looked at W3 total cache too much, so I don't know if that's part of your recommended deployment or whatever. Uh, well, W3 Total Cache does have some support for Varnish, but I mean, your, your point is well received. I mean, this, this, I tried to limit the scope, even though I talked about caching, at least for the benefit of clean performance optimization. Um, I, I tried to limit the scope there, but, you know, wholeheartedly agree. Uh, Mashable uses Varnish as a reverse proxy, and basically, you know, by setting the headers and everything else that I do for all the objects in W3 Total Cache, Varnish knows what my caching policy is, and then Supports that, and then the net, you know, the net uh, request to the back end, which is Apache in our case, is significantly reduced, and it ends up only, you know, handling requests that, uh, you know, work uh, cache misses ultimately, right? No static objects as well, and then uh, with um, with APC, uh, you know, caching on uh, on respective web heads, basically WordPress runs, runs in memory except for any database misses, things like that. So, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, it's just out of the scope of the talk, actually. Done. All right, thanks for your time.